Part 5. Preparation Once we know his eternal plan and purpose for us, plus his method of preparation and process to the end, there is rest and confidence. Now it so happens that God's basic ingredient for growth is need. Without personal needs, we would get nowhere in our Christian life. The reason our Father creates and allows needs in our lives is to turn us from all that is outside of Christ, centering us in him alone, not I, but Christ. For both our growth and service, it's all essential that we see and understand this principle, which J.B. Stoney sets forth in this sentence. He writes, The soul never imbibes the truth in living power, but as it requires it. As for our growth, needs cause us to reach out and appropriate by faith from the Lord Jesus what we require. And in the matter of service, in witnessing and helping others, we must watch and wait for the hungry, the needy heart, if there is to be any abiding fruit. Again, Stoney says this, the true value of anything is known only when it is wanted. J.N. Darby makes this doubly clear by writing the following. Wisdom and philosophy never found out God. He makes himself known to us through our needs. Necessity finds him out. I doubt much if we have ever learned anything solidly except we have learned it thus. In this light, our needs are invaluable. We must face up to the fact that without spiritual hunger, we cannot feed on the Lord Jesus Christ. From our personal experience, Matthew chapter 5 verse 6 should mean much to every one of us. We read there, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. All too often believers are exhorted and even pressured to grow before there is an acute awareness of need, before there is a true spiritual hunger. And sad to say, in most instances, where there is real heart hunger, very little spiritual food is offered. One of the main reasons for so much evangelistic effort and personal work coming to little or nothing is that truths are forced on the victim to be saved before he is even aware that he is lost. The work will soon come to naught unless an overpowering conviction of sin causes the lost to reach out with the grip of personal faith and find their need fully met in their saviour. Watchman Nee puts first things first by saying this, the Lord does not set us here first of all to preach or to do any work for him. The first thing for which he sets us here is to create hunger in others. No true work will ever begin without a sense of need being created. We cannot inject that into others. We cannot drive people to hunger. That hunger is to be created. And that hunger can only be created through those who carry the impression of God. In preparation, there is a tearing down before there can be a building up. In Hosea 6 verse 1 we read this, Come, and let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. This applies to both growth and to service. J.C. Metcalf faithfully writes the following. It is more than comforting to realise that it is those who have plumbed the depths of failure to whom God invariably gives the call to shepherd others. This is not a call given to the gifted, the highly trained, or the polished as such. Without a bitter experience of their own inadequacy and poverty, they are quite unfitted to bear the burden of spiritual ministry. It takes a man who's discovered something of the measure of his own weakness 
to be patient with the foibles of others. Such a man also has a first-hand knowledge of the loving care of the chief shepherd and his ability to heal one who has come humbly to trust in him and in him alone. Therefore he does not easily despair of others, but looks beyond sinfulness, willfulness and stupidity, to the might of unchanging love. The Lord Jesus does not give the charge, be a shepherd to my lambs, to my sheep, on hearing Peter's self-confident affirmation of undying loyalty, but rather he gives it after he has utterly failed to keep his vows and has wept bitterly in the streets of Jerusalem. Yes, there must be deep, thorough and long preparation if there is to be reality, if our life is to be Christ-centred, our work controlled by the Holy Spirit, and our service glorifying to God. Sooner or later the Holy Spirit begins to make us aware of our basic problem as believers the infinite difference between self and Christ. There are other labourers beside those who are seeking for pardon, for justification. There are labourers for sanctification, after personal holiness, after riddance of the power of the old Adam, and to such as well as to those that are seeking after salvation, Christ promises with this great I will in Matthew chapter 11, 28 to 30. It is highly possible for a man, after having found justifying rest in Christ, to enter upon a state of deep need as regards sanctifying rest. We think we shall not go far wrong if we say that this has been the experience of almost every believer who has ever lived. Much of his preparation in our lives consists of setting up this struggle, our seeing self for what it is, and then attempting to get free from its evil power and influence. For there is no hope of consistently abiding in the Lord Jesus as long as we are under the dominion of the self-life, in which dwelleth no good thing, Romans 7 verse 18. Not in babyhood are we able to continually abide in his presence, regardless of our surroundings and that which we are doing. Not when we serve him with intermittent zeal does our soul grow and thrive. Not when we are indifferent are we watered from the presence of the Lord. It is after we have been subdued, refined and chastened, when love of self, and love of the world is gone, that we learn to abide in touch with him at all times and in all places and in all surroundings. The value of both the struggle to free ourselves from the old Adam life and the equally fruitless efforts to experience the new Adam life, the Christ life, is to finally realise that it is utterly futile. Our personal, heartbreaking failure in every phase of our Christian life is our Father's preparation for his success on our behalf. This negative processing of his finally brings us into his positive promise of Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. His good work in us is begun through failure and this includes our strongest points which continue on into success by his performance and not ours. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do to his good pleasure. Philippians 2 verse 13. There is no question but that we all begin in sheer grace and we must continue and arrive on that very same basis. In Galatians 5 verse 1 we are told to stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. 
Charles Trumbull said, The effortless life is not the willless life. We use our will to believe, to receive, but not to exert effort in trying to accomplish what only God can do. Our hope for victory over sin is not Christ plus my efforts, but Christ plus my receiving. To receive victory from him is to believe his word that solely by his grace he is, this moment, freeing us from the dominion of sin. And to believe on him in this way is to recognise that he is doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We learned this principle at the time of our spiritual birth. And it seems that most of us have to learn it over and over again for our spiritual growth and service. Fear not, dear friend. Just hold firm to the fact of his purpose for you in Christ. And he will faithfully take you step by step into the necessary preparation. He will do it. Once you are sure of your purpose, you can be equally positive of the preparation. Simply remember that Romans 8, 28 and 29 go together. And thank him for Philippians 1, verse 6. The Lord is glorified in a people whose heart is set at any cost, by any road, upon the goal which is God himself. A man who is thus minded says, by any road. Here is a very difficult road. Here is a road beset by enemies. But the passionate desire for the goal will hold him steadfast in the way. It is the man who lacks the yearning to know him that will easily be turned aside. Along that road, the man Christ Jesus has already gone before. And at every point has overcome for us. We have not to climb up. We are to be brought through in the train of his triumph. Every enemy has been met. Every foe has been overcome. There remains nothing that has not been put potentially beneath his feet. And there remains nothing in this universe that is able to overcome the least child of God who has taken the hand of the Lord and said, Lord, bring me through to the place where thou art in virtue of the blood which thou hast already taken through in victory. There is great glory of the Lord in a quiet, confident walk in a day of adversity, a day of dread, when things about us are shaking and trembling. Part 6. Complete in Him We continue to deal with foundational facts, since the life can be no better than its roots, its source. Youth and immaturity tend to act first and think later, if at all. Maturity has learned to take time to assess the facts. Our patient husbandman is willing for us to take time and learn the eternal facts without which we cannot be brought to maturity. Our Lord Jesus so often uses the natural facts to teach us the deepest spiritual truths. He first teaches us about our natural Adamic life before we can understand and appreciate our new spiritual Christ life. This involves the vital source principle, after his kind. Every believer first learns that he is complete in Adam, he sprang from him, and he is like him. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, Romans 5.19, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, for I know that in me dwelleth no good thing, Romans 7, 18. When, through our failures and struggles, he has taught us about the natural, we will be ready to learn of our spiritual source. By the obedience of one shall many be made righteous, 
we're told in Romans 5.19. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. Colossians 2 verse 9. There are two main aspects to this source principle. First, the Lord Jesus is the source of all Christian life. We were born into him. God has made us complete in him. This truth we are to hold by faith. It is true of each of us. For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Second, as we hold to this fact by faith, we are brought into the practical reality of it day by day in our experience. Little by little we receive what is already ours. The important thing to know and to be sure of is that all is ours and we are complete in him now. This fact enables us to hold still while he patiently works into our character that life of ours which is hid with Christ in God. Progress is only advancing in the knowledge, the spiritual knowledge, of what we really possess at the outset. It's like ascending a ladder, the ladder of grace. The first step is we believe. We believe that the Lord Jesus was sent of God. Second, that in the fullness of his work we are justified. Third, we make his acquaintance. Fourth, we come to see him in heaven. We know our association with him there and his power here. Fifth, we learn the mystery, the great things we are entitled to because of being his body. Sixth, we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. And seventh, lost in wonder and in praise in the knowledge of him. Since we are complete in our Lord Jesus, it will not do to try and add to that finished work. It is now a matter of walking by faith and receiving, appropriating from the ever-abundant source within. Walter Marshall is concise here. He says Christ's resurrection was our resurrection to a life of holiness, as Adam's fall was a fall into spiritual death. And we are not ourselves the first makers and formers of our new holy nature, any more than of our original corruption but both are formed ready for us to partake of them. And by union with Christ, we partake of that spiritual life that he took possession of for us at his resurrection, and thereby we are enabled to bring forth the fruit of it, as the scripture showeth by the similitude of a marriage union. Romans 7 verse 4 says, Marriage to another even unto him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Our part is not production, but reception of our life in Christ. This entails Bible-based fact-finding, explicit faith in him and his purpose for us in Christ, and patient trust while he takes us through the necessary processing involved. No believer ever fell into maturity, even though he is complete in Christ. Spiritual growth necessitates heart hunger for the Lord, determination based on assurance to have that which is ours in him, plus meditation and thought. We will never come into the knowledge of our spiritual possessions through a superficial understanding of the word, how can we ever have intimate fellowship with one of whom we know little? The following truth may be a good opportunity to exercise and develop some of that meditation and thought. What is needed is a mediation in which God concentrates his own peculiar spirit and life as a principle 
in a human individual to be personally appropriated in a revelation which is really to translate the divine into man's individual personal life in truth to form men of God the divine as such that is as a personal life must first be embodied in a personal center in humanity which would be Jesus for this reason as soon as something strictly new is concerned something that in its peculiarity has not yet existed every new type of life before it can multiply itself to a number of specimens must first have its full content combined in perfect unity in an adequate new principle and so for the making personal of the divine among men the first thing needed is one in whom the principle of the divine life has become personal Jesus Christianity concentrates the whole fullness of revelation in the one human personality of Jesus Christ as mediator that is as the mediating central principle of the new divine organism in its fullness of spirit and life in and for the human personal life. With the entrance of Christ into the human individual, the divine life becomes imminent in us, not in its universal world relation, but in a personal principle so that man is not only a being made of God, but a being begotten of God. And with the growing transformation of the individual into the life type of Christ, there is perfected the development of the personal life out of God, in God, and to God. The development not only of a moral and theocratic communion, but a communion of nature. A seed embodies in full the reproduction of the life from which it came. That much is complete and can never be added to. Being born again, we're told in 1 Peter 1, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Leviticus 19, 19 says, Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. It is to be not I, but Christ. The seed has been implanted. Now the entire question is one of growth and maturity. This alone will bring forth fruit that abides. The development of the divine life in the Christian is like the natural growth in the vegetable world. We do not need to make any special effort. Only place ourselves under the conditions favourable to such growth. Only those who have sought to grow by effort and failed are in a position to appreciate the fact that God is the aggressor in the realm of development. All the power of deity which... All the powers of God which have already wrought together in the accomplishment of the first part of the eternal purpose, that is the revealing of the Father's perfect likeness in the man Christ Jesus, are equally engaged to accomplish the second part and work that likeness in each of God's children. William Law agrees. He writes, A root set in the finest soil in the best climate and blessed with all that sun and air and rain can do for it is not so sure aware of its growth to perfection as every man may be whose spirit aspires after all that God is ready and infinitely desirous to give him. For the sun doesn't meet the springing bud that stretches towards him with half the certainty of God, the source of all good, who communicates himself to the soul that longs to partake of him. Not only is our life complete in him, but likewise the essential victory 
in all the many pressures of that life. When you fight to get victory, then you have lost the battle at the very outset. Suppose the enemy assaults you in your home or in your business. He creates a situation in which you cannot possibly deal. What do you do? Your first instinct is to prepare yourself for a big battle and then pray to God to give you the victory in it. But if you do so, defeat is sure, for you have given up the ground that is yours in Christ. By the attitude that you have taken, you relinquish it to the enemy. What then should you do when the enemy attacks? You should simply look up and praise the Lord. Lord, I am faced with a situation that I cannot possibly meet. Your enemy, the devil, has brought it about to compass my downfall. But I praise thee that thou hast the victory in an all-inclusive victory. It covers this situation too, and I praise thee that I have already full victory in this matter. And remember, don't rush, because he won't. The Japanese artist, Hakusai, said the following. He said, from the age of six, I had a mania for drawing the forms of things. By the time I was 50, I had published an infinite number of designs, but nothing I produced before 70 is even worth considering. He died at 89, declaring that if he could have just had another five years, he would have become a great artist. Part 7. Appropriation. Here is an important subject that has to do with faith and the practical reception of that for which we are able to trust him. Appropriation doesn't necessarily mean to gain something new, but to set aside for our practical possession something that already belongs to us. To appropriate something for our daily walk in Christ, we face two essentials. To see what is already ours in Christ, and to be aware of our need for it. On these two factors rest the ability to appropriate, that is to reach out in steadfast faith and receive what belongs to us in our Lord Jesus Christ. Regarding the first essential, to see what is already ours, William R. Newell wrote the following. He says, Paul does not ask a thing of the saints in the first three chapters of Ephesians, but just to listen while he proclaims that wonderful series of great eternal facts concerning them, and not until he has completed this catalogue of realities about them does he ask them to do anything at all. And when he does open his plea for their high walk as saints, everything is based on the revelation before given, the fact of their high character and destiny as saints. We read, I therefore beseech you that walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Ephesians 4 verse 1. Let us cease laying down to the saints long lists of conditions on entering into the blessed life in Christ, and instead, as the primal preparation for leading them into the experience of this life, show them what their position, possessions, and privileges in Christ already are. Thus we truly work with the Holy Spirit, and thus shall we have more and much more abiding fruit in our labours among the people of God. Once we see what is ours in Christ Jesus, practical need will cause us to appropriate, to receive the answer to that need. There was a supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ for Paul, and that made it possible for Christ to be magnified in him. It was a supply which was already available but only appreciated and appropriated as and when the Apostle came to know his need. Life is meant to bring a succession of discoveries of our need of Christ. 
and with every such discovery, the way is opened for a new inflow of the supply. This is the explanation of so much that we cannot otherwise understand. This plunging of us into new tests, where only a fresh supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ will meet our need. And as our need is met, as we prove the sufficiency of Christ to meet our inward need, so there can be a new showing forth of his glory through us. These two realities of seeing and needing bring us from childish meandering into a responsible, specific walk of faith. They take us from the help me attitude to that of giving thanks, from begging to appropriation. Notice what L. L. Letgers, co-founder of the Whitcliffe Bible Translators, has to say about this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 verse 3. If you run over in your mind and find one single blessing with which God might bless us today, with which he has not already blessed us, then what he told Paul was not true at all, because he saith, God hath. It is done. It is finished. God hath blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. The great pity of it all is that we are saying, Oh God, bless us, Bless us in this and bless us in that. But it's all done. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. As C.A. Coates said, it is appropriation that tests us. How often we stop at admiration. From time to time, the Holy Spirit will bring our attention to a certain aspect of the word in a striking manner and we will rejoice to see and believe that it is ours in Christ. It may be, for instance, the truth of Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Beside the usual personal situations, the uncertainty, strife and tensions of the world conditions provide us just what is needed for the believer to abide, to rest in the Lord Jesus. The need exists, and when he sees the rest in him, all there remains to do is to appropriate it. So far, so good. The believer sees what he possesses in Christ, and the need enables him to reach out and confidently appropriate and accept the required rest. This appropriation must be a case of clear, scriptural, specific trust. We are not to ask amiss. And now comes the critical phase, the key to it all. In most instances of appropriation, there is a waiting period between the acceptance and the receiving, often of years. Our responsibility is to patiently wait on him during the time necessary for him to work into our character, into our life, that which we have appropriated in Christ. In this instance, his rest, steadiness, assurance and security. A God who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him. Isaiah 64 verse 4. T. Austin Sparks gave us two valuable thoughts regarding this all-important gap, and usually a matter of years. The gap between the actual appropriation and the practical experience. Every bit of truth we receive, if we receive it lovingly, will take us into conflict and will be established through conflict. It'll be worthless unless there's been a battle over it. Take any position the Lord calls you to take and if you are taking it with him, you are going through things in it and there'll be an element added by reason of the battle. You have taken a position, yes, but you have not really got it yet. The real value of it has not been proved.
You have not come into the real significance of it until there has been some sore conflict in relation to it. As a result of the work of his cross, and as a grand issue of his resurrection, eternal life is received already by those who believe. But while that life is itself victorious, incorruptible, indestructible, the believer has to come by faith to prove it, to live by it, to learn its laws, to be conformed into it. There is a deposit in the believer which in itself needs no addition, so far as its quality is concerned, so far as its victory, its power and its glory, its potentialities are concerned, nothing can be added to it. But the course of spiritual experience, of spiritual life, is to discover, to appropriate and to live by all that the life represents and means. Now we have seen a third element involved in our appropriation. After we have seen our possessions in Christ and become aware of our need, then we must give the necessary time to work the appropriation into our everyday walk. If we are looking for our needs to be met in the next interview or the next devotional book, the next series of special meetings or the next hope for revival, then reality will never come. In this matter of Christian development, there is no shortcut. There's no quick and easy way. The husbandman builds into the believer that which he intends to minister through him to others. To minister life to others, what one does and says must flow from what he is. For it pleases the Father that in him, that is in Christ Jesus, that in him should all fullness dwell. For we are made partakers of Christ, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. For your life is hid with Christ in God, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. How often we simply admire and talk about truths the Holy Spirit reveals to us in the Word, whereas his primary purpose in giving them to us is that we might stand on them in faith, walking confidently for him to make them an integral part of our life. A prophet is one who has history, one who has been dealt with by God, one who has experienced the formative work of the Spirit, we are sometimes asked by would-be preachers how many days should be spent in preparation for a sermon. Well, the answer is at least 10 years and probably nearer 20. For the preacher matters to God at least as much as the things that he preaches. God chooses as his prophets those in whom he has already worked what he intends to use in his message for today. Part 8. Identification. As our thinking moves along from the substitutionary truths, that's the new birth, onto the identification truths, that's growth, it might be good to consider briefly what leaders, honoured of God through the years, have had to say about identification as centred on Romans chapter 6. Evan H. Hopkins says this, The trouble of the believer who knows Christ as his justification is not sin as to its guilt, but sin as to its ruling power. In other words, it is not from sin as a load or as an offence that he seeks to be freed, for he sees that God has completely acquitted him from the charge and the penalty of sin, but rather it is from sin as a master. To know God's way of deliverance from sin as a master, he must apprehend the truth contained in the sixth chapter of Romans. There we see what God has done, not with our sins. That question the Apostle dealt with in the preceding chapter, 
No, not with our sins, but with ourselves, the agents and the slaves of sin. He has put our old man, that is our original self, he's put our old man where he put our sins, namely on the cross with Christ. We read in Romans 6 verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. The believer there sees not only that Christ died for him, which is substitution, but that he died with Christ, identification. Andrew Murray says this, Like Christ, the believer too has died to sin. He is one with Christ in the likeness of his death. Romans 6 verse 5. And as the knowledge that Christ died for our sins as an atonement is indispensable to our justification, so the knowledge that Christ and we with him in the likeness of his death are dead to sin. And this is indispensable to our sanctification. J. Hudson Taylor said this, Since Christ has thus dwelt in my heart by faith, how happy I am. I am dead and buried with Christ, ay, and risen too. And now Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Nor should we look upon this experience, these truths, as for the few. They are the birthright of every child of God, and no one can dispense with them without dishonouring the Lord. William R. Newell wrote this, To those who refuse to neglect to reckon themselves dead to sin as God commands, we press the question, how are you able to believe that Christ really bear the guilt of your sins and that you will not meet them on Judgment Day? It is only God's word that tells you that Christ bear your sins in his body on the tree. And it is that same word that tells you that you are connected with Adam, died with Christ, that your old man was crucified, and since you are in Christ, you share his death unto sin, and are thus to reckon your present relation to sin in Christ as one who is dead to it and alive unto God. Lewis Sperry Schaefer wrote the following. The theme under consideration is concerned with the death of Christ as the death is related to divine judgment of the sin nature in the child of God. The necessity for judgments and the sublime revelation that these judgments are now fully accomplished for us is unfolded in Romans 6, verses 1 to 10. This passage is the foundation as well as the key to the possibility of a walk in the Spirit. Ruth Paxson said the following, The old I in you and me was judicially crucified with Christ. Ye died, and your death dates from the death of Christ. The old man, that is the old self, in God's reckoning was taken to the cross with Christ and crucified and taken into the tomb with Christ and there buried. Assurance of deliverance from the sphere of the flesh and of the dethronement of the old man rests upon the apprehension and acceptance of this fact of co-crucifixion with Christ. Watchman Nee said the following, Our sins were dealt with by the blood. We ourselves are dealt with by the cross. The blood procures our pardon. The cross procures deliverance from what we are in Adam. The blood can wash away my sins, but it cannot wash away my old man. I need the cross to crucify me, the sinner. Ellie Maxwell said, Believers in Christ were joined to him at the cross, united to him in death and resurrection. We died with Christ. He died for us and we died with him. This is a great fact 
true of all believers. Norman B. Harrison said the following, This is the distinctive mark of the Christian, the experience of the cross. Not merely that Christ died for us, but that we died with him, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Romans 6 verse 6. F.J. Hugel said the following, If the great Luther, with his stirring message of justification by faith, had with Paul moved on from Romans 5 to Romans 6 with its amazing declarations concerning the now justified sinner's position of identification with his crucified Lord, would not a stifled Protestantism be on the highest ground today? Might it not be free from its ulcerous fleshliness? Alexander R. Hay said the following, The believer has been united with Christ in his death. In this union with Christ, the flesh, the body of sin, the entire fallen, sin-ruined being with its intelligence, will and desires, the body of sin is judged and crucified. By faith, the believer reckons or counts himself dead unto sin. T. Austin Sparks said this, The first phase of our spiritual experience may be a great and overflowing joy with a marvellous sense of emancipation. In this phase, extravagant things are often said as to the total deliverance and final victory. Then there may, and often does, come a phase of which inward conflict is the chief feature. It may be very much of a Roman 7 experience. This will lead under the Lord's hand to a fuller knowledge of the meaning of identification with Christ, as in Romans 6. Oh, happy is the man who has been instructed in this from the beginning. Jesse Penn Lewis said the following. If the difference between Christ dying for us and our dying with him has not been recognised, acknowledged and applied, it may safely be affirmed that the self is still the dominating factor of our life. William Cuthbertson said, Who dies on the cross? Of course our blessed Lord died on the cross, but who else? Who else died there? Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And James McConkey wrote this, Because he died, death hath no more dominion over him. And because of our union with him, sin shall not have dominion over you, even though it is present in you. Our reckoning ourselves dead to sin in Jesus Christ doesn't make it a fact. It is already a fact through our union with him. Our reckoning it to be true only makes us begin to realise the fact in experience.